Okay, I think we should start. Uh, colleagues are joining, and and the number is going to go up. Uh, I think in the few in the few minutes of introduction that I will make before you start, um, uh, Charles. We have 115 participants at this point, which is good. Uh, so let's begin. Um, well, hello everyone, and, and welcome to our second webinar today. Uh, this is the second webinar session, session in the UNICEF webinar series on data collection, which is organized by data and analytics section at UNICEF headquarters. Uh, I'm Attila Hanjolo, uh, chief of the data collection unit in the data and analytics section here uh, in, in New York, UNICEF. We just ended the other webinar, the first webinar, which was on the uh, social media advertising data by Umar Weber of the Qatar Computing Research Institute. As uh, I think most of you attended the first webinar, I will not repeat uh, the background of these webinars, but just to say that uh, once again, uh, just to say that we will be running these webinars until the end of October, uh, each one on one or more data collection methods. The emphasis will be on methodology of data collection as opposed to sectoral or topical content. But of course, uh, we will be uh, referring to topical content as well. Uh, while we discuss the methodologies. All of these webinars are being recorded uh, and they're going to be uploaded together with the presentation itself to the SharePoint site, uh, which will be dedicated to the light guidance mechanism that we are establishing. And it will be there uh, together with background notes on various data collection methods, which will come from us, uh, reading materials, a questionnaire bank we are intending to have, and as well as a dedicated team member who will respond to and provide light guidance on queries coming from the field. Some ground rules before we start. Uh, throughout the webinar, please remain muted. Uh, please write your questions in the chat box. Our speaker uh, will have a chance to answer your questions as, as time permits. And we will support uh, Charles for uh, grouping those questions and, and, uh, and raising those questions. Now our... Uh, Second webinar today is on data collection via interactive voice response, IVR, uh, and SMS. And our speaker is, as you see on the screen, is Charles Lau from RTI International. Charles will present for uh, 40 minutes, and then we will then have a Q&A for 15 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, to introduce Charles, uh, if I may, Charles designs and implements surveys in low and middle income countries. He directs projects through the survey cycle, including study design, questionnaire development, sampling, interviewer training, data collection, analysis, and reporting. Uh, Charles has led uh, surveys in 17 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And in these countries, he has used different modes of data collection, including face-to-face -face interviewing with tablets, uh, telephones, uh, web, and SMS surveys. He also publishes research on cross-cultural issues in survey design, interviewer and mode effects, and sampling approaches in developing countries. So before we start, I would like to thank Charles for agreeing to present in our webinar series. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles. Now, uh, please share your screen. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Very well, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, and thank you for the introduction. And it's I was looking at the chat box and it was so nice to see everyone from all over the world. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about IVR or interactive voice response and SMS. Um, you know, the past six months have really been a whirlwind as organizations have pivoted away from traditional modes of collecting data through face-to-face -face and have really embraced new and innovative modes of data collection. Um, and the pace of change is, like, I would say, truly remarkable. Um, I feel like we're seeing changes that would have taken five or 10 years or even more um, to happen. Uh, we're seeing those changes in just a matter of months. Um, so for example, I just finished up a, a telephone survey for PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization in Bolivia on COVID. Um, that was their first um, telephone survey they did like that. Um, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, the World Bank is 
conducting surveys on COVID um, in about 100 countries. Um, and I'm uh, serving as a technical advisor to them. So it's really interesting to see that program of um, survey research um, evolve. Um, so today I'm really um, honored to speak with you about um, our research and project experience with IVR and SMS and, and that of others, and really eager during the Q&A to hear about some of the challenges that, that you're facing um, in your work and how some of these new modes of data collection um, might support the work that you're doing. So today we'll, um, I'll start by um, talking about how IVR and SMS work. Um, then I'll just briefly touch on some use cases, just some examples to give you a sense of um, um, examples of projects that could be done. The meat of the presentation is in um, sections four and five. These will look at methodological issues in mobile phone surveys with IVR and SMS. So we'll talk about population representation and measurement quality. And then maybe the most important part um, is at the end, which is getting started. So if you want to conduct these surveys in your own work, how would you do that? So I'm hoping by the end of this, you'll sort of know the basics about IVR and SMS, their strengths and weaknesses, a few best practices, and then know, know where to, to start. Okay, so the first section that I'll go through is um, the basic functioning of, of these modes of data collection. So let's just take a step back first and think about differences between face-to-face -face surveys on one hand and mobile phone surveys on the other. Um, so face-to-face um, -face surveys, of course, can include all respondents, even those without phones. Um, you clearly have an interviewer present, you know, who can persuade the household to participate, to um, probe and clarify any questions. Um, these face-to-face -face surveys are clearly the gold standard um, in low and middle income countries. And I know in a lot of UNICEF surveys, there are you know, bio, biological specimen collection and observational data as possible. Um, on the flip side, of course, face-to-face -face surveys are not really possible now. Um, there are, for many applications, they can be cost and time prohibitive and you have interviewer effects to, to deal with. So over the last, you know, I, I would say 10 years, but really over the past five years, mobile phone surveys has, have emerged in low and um, middle income countries. Um, they're less expensive. Um, if you have a, you know, relatively short survey, they can be really fast. So we just did a study in Ghana, collected um, uh, about 3000 interviews in just a matter of six days. Um, so it can be really fast um, and good for certain use cases. Um, if, you have, if you're studying a conflict affected area where face-to-face -face interviewers can't go, mobile phones may be a good way to, to go. Um, and you can collect momentary data. So like you could send us um, daily surveys on food security, for example, or nutrition um, um, using mobile phones. Of course, there, there are shorter, lower response rates and they're less representative um, compared to face-to-face. Okay, so they're, um, they're actually, here I'm talking about mobile phone surveys generally, but there are various types of modes of collecting data using mobile phones. So IVR is interactive voice response. So this is, these are automated phone surveys. Let me see if the recording will work. This is from a um, project in Zambia we did with the Ministry of Health. So that's IVR. I'm sure many of you have done IVR to, you know, to call your bank um, or, uh, or other items, and it's also applicable for surveys. Um, SMS surveys are where there's one SMS per survey question. Um, people reply with the number associated with their response, and then they get the next survey question here. Um, another mode of data collection is, you know, live um, telephone interviewing. Um, the jargon term is computer assisted telephone interviewing, but these are just live uh, phone surveys with um, interviewers at a call center. Um, the, I think I believe there, there might be another session on these surveys. So I'm not going to talk too much about um, these live interviews, but I will reference them as a way to compare um, IVR and SMS to, to other modes. So, so and then of course, sorry for, sorry yes. for interrupting, but uh, uh, colleagues are saying that they didn't hear the, uh, the IVR recording. 
Oh, they didn't. Okay. I think it's something with the audio with Zoom, but basically the IVR, um, um, it says, you know, have you ever been told, an example, have you ever been told by a doctor or health worker that you have raised blood sugar or diabetes? Press one for yes, plus press three for no. So people listen to audio, automated um, or audio recorded messages, and then they input a number associated with their response on their keypad, and then the next question comes. So here's a um, summary comparison of the different modes. Um, so IVR and SMS are, um, or sorry, CADI, or these are the live phone interviews, are both, um, CADI and IVR are both voice, whereas SMS is a text messaging. Um, IVR is, and SMS are both self-administered, whereas um, phone interviews are administered by an interviewer. IVR and SMS are um, much shorter than um, a live um, phone interview. Um, uh, both the voice interviews are, are, don't require literacy, of course, whereas SMS requires literacy. Um, SMS is the least expensive and the fastest mode um, by far. Um, the phone interviews are typically the slowest, um, although the cost and speed of uh, phone interviews and IVR, it really varies quite a bit by country. Um, so I'll talk more about country specific differences a bit later in the presentation. So how, how are these implemented in a, in a phone survey? They're through a call center. Um, there are a lot of vendors that have their own call center set up or organizations can set these up in-house. Um, same thing with IVR and SMS, you can work with the vendor or you could do this in-house as well. Okay, so, so um, a few words on sampling. Um, these sampling options really apply to all modes of data collection. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware about sampling issues, but um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, here are some options for mobile phone surveys. Um, so one is random digit dialing, or it's called RDD is the acronym. This involves a random generation of phone numbers um, using the numbering system of the, for phone numbers in each country. So the, on the plus side, these samples can be really large, um, as large as you could, um, um, you know, fit basically in a survey. You can stratify the sample by geography um, or a mobile network operator to ensure representation from those groups. Um, it's inexpensive. Um, it just takes about an hour to generate, an, you know, random, um, randomly generated numbers. Um, of course, we don't have a lot of information about each number, right? So we don't know the characteristics like the gender, education, of people associated with those phone numbers. So when we're trying to adjust for um, any bias in the data collection, we have limited ways to do that with RDD. Um, it's also relatively inefficient because you have a lot of numbers that are non-working. Um, so RDD, this is an example. We did this with PAHO in Bolivia. We use RDD um, methods. Um, another approach is a list sample. Um, so you can get a list of phone numbers from a variety of sources. One of the more common ones these days is to recontact people who participated in face-to-face -face surveys before. Uh, this is the approach that the World Bank is largely using, um, although the World Bank is using some RDD as well. Um, so here the benefit is that you have a lot of information for weighting. So you have all the characteristics of people from the face-to-face -face survey that you can use to adjust for any biases in the mobile phone um, data collection. Um, you know, downsides are your, you know, the phone numbers may not be valid if it's not recent. There was one um, paper from uh, Liberia showing that after six months, about 50% uh, or so of the phone numbers um, had gone inactive because people changed phone numbers quite a bit. Again, varies quite a bit by country. Um, and of course, you're limited by, uh, in your sample size, by how many people you have in the prior survey. Um, the third option is a list sample from the telecom company. So this is um, kind of a method that sometimes people think of first, but it's the most difficult to get. Um, telecom companies will, uh, are very re reticent to provide their um, subscriber lists to organizations. Typically, you have to have the government involved at a high level. And even if the even if it is a government-sponsored survey, it's quite difficult to, to get these. 
but if you can, you have it's great, you have high levels of coverage and you have information to adjust. So some key concepts for, um, for IVR and SMS. So you have um, one key um, component is language selection. So in a, a multilingual countries, typically it'll start with an introduction in like a lingua franca or a language hopefully most people understand. Um, and then the person, people can select their language and then the consent and all the subsequent survey questions come in, in that language. But the how to do language selection is a, is a key design feature in IVR and SMS. Um, the next slide will show you an example of that. Um, typically IVR and SMS do provide incentives for participation, um, usually around a um, dollar US or um, half a dollar US um, in prepaid um, airtime credit. Um, if you are doing a study with um, higher income people, sometimes they have postpaid, um, you know, like monthly subscriptions and their incentives become more difficult, but typically it's prepaid um, airtime. Air um, and for SMS surveys, um, the, um, the surveys are usually set up so it's no, there's no cost to the participant to, to reply back and forth. Um, it's, that's free to the respondent. Um, and then they also get an incentive at the end. Um, another concept is channel. So this is how your voice calls for IVR or SMS are delivered to respondents. So this is about how your you know, survey program, your survey tool where you input your questions, how that program kind of talks, routes calls through the telecommunications network to um, on the way to respondents. So that's kind of a technical issue, but it's an important one that we can talk about later. And there are also, you know, outbound and inbound calls, right? So um, the typical is outbound calls where, you know, we call the respondent and ask them to participate. Another method is inbound calls, right? Where the, respond where the respondent somehow has a phone number that they can text or call um, and initiate communication. Um, inbound is oftentimes used with health, with health interventions as well. You know, it'll say um, text, you know, 4420, um, um, to learn about maternal and child health program or something like that. And then there might be a brief survey. This is an example of a language selection uh, from a SMS survey we did with the Ministry of Health in Zambia. So in, in, in English, it said, you know, hello, this is a survey for English text one, Bemba two, et cetera. And then, um, then there's the consent in other, um, in, in the selected language. So I wanted to just talk very briefly about a few use cases or examples of, of, these, um, of these projects. Um, so I'm just showing three here on the slide. There are a lot of really interesting ones um, from a survey research perspective. Um, so here, the first is um, NCD surveillance projects. So NCDs are non-communicable diseases. So like chronic diseases like heart disease, hypertension, et cetera. Um, so the Bloomberg Philanthropies is funding the CDC, um, the US CDC and ministries of health in eight countries to explore using IVR and SMS for NCD surveillance of risk factors. So countries um, have very little information on NCD risk factors, um, um, diet, tobacco use, um, alcohol use, et cetera. Um, so this project is a way to help strengthen the capacity of these countries to be able to collect NCD data, which is um, missing in a lot of countries or is not collected very frequently. Um, so that's one example where we're conducting population-based surveys using RDD um, methodology. Uh, for those of you familiar with the World Food Program, you might know about the, um, uh, the mobile vulner vulnerability um, analysis mapping um, project. So that is a multimodal um, project that uses live calls, um, SMS, IVR, and web. So they have these four data collection methods that they collect um, really high frequency data in various countries. And then they pipe those data back into a dashboard and a lot of really interesting mapping tools to support you know, humanitarian decision-making uh, processes. And this also uses, you know, two-way communication. So, you know, um, uh, respondents can text in or call in, as well as we, um, the WFP calls calls respondents. Um, 
Another one is disaster response. So if you remember, I think this was this was in 2019, there was a, a cyclone in Mozambique um, and uh, Geopol is a vendor and what they, they have a set up in Mozambique and collected data, I believe within uh, just a few days of the cyclone and they collected data about um, people's um, coping and disaster response. So this is an example where the speed and scale of phone surveys is really um, pretty um, unmatched. There are also a lot of use cases beyond surveys. So, you know, I'm a re survey researcher. We'll talk mostly about surveys here, but IVR and SMS go beyond um, just surveys. So, uh, for example, there's an exam um, a project in Ethiopia that where they use SMS to monitor um, drug stocks in health facilities. So people would text in about their um, supply of essential medicines and then to a central system, and that would trigger resupplies. Um, that's one example in, in Ethiopia. Kenya is using, um, the, the Ministry of Education is using um, SMS and other mobile survey tools to measure um, um, school indicators, um, teacher presence, student, student um, absenteeism, et cetera. Um, of course, uh, with, this is a UNICEF audience, so I would um, be neglectful if I didn't mention the citizen feedback. So you report, of course, with UNICEF was an early, early and successful example of citizen feedback um, as well. Okay, so let's turn to the next phase, which is about population representation. So here, um, this section is all about how well do our survey samples match the uh, um, population's characteristics. And there are two main errors that can lead to problems with representing populations. And these errors um, are particular to um, mobile phone surveys. Um, so coverage error is the first one. So this is the kind of obvious one um, that people without mobile phones cannot be included in these surveys. Uh, people with and without mobile phones are different, so that introduces not, you know, um, bias into um, into the survey estimates because of coverage error. Um, and all mobile phone modes have have this error, and of course, all this error varies across countries. Uh, mobile phone surveys are more accurate and representative in countries with higher um, higher penetration of mobile phones. Um, Second is non-response error. So um, it, even if uh, people do have, have phones, how many people respond? And do the people who respond, are they different than those who don't respond? So all mobile phone um, modes share some common non-response errors, right? You don't have an interviewer there in person to build rapport with the, with the respondent. The, interview, the introductions are short. Um, you know, network, network connections to be, can be tough. Um, and people oftentimes, you know, keep their phones turned off um, unless they unless they need them. But then there are some kind of mode specific error, you know, things that can happen which can result in non-response error. So, you know, the the caddy, which is the live phone interviews, um, have they don't have an interviewer in person, but at least you have someone on the phone. Whereas SMS and IVR don't have that. Um, SMS and IVR also require some, you know, technological familiarity. So, um, you know, the concept of inputting a number associated with your response after listening to an audio recording um, can be a novel concept, and that can result in, in non-response. Um, SMS requires literacy, of course, and even even if we tell people that there's no cost to reply in the SMS introduction, people still may hesitate, right? Um, especially lower socioeconomic people may not, um, may not trust that, that it's truly free to participate. On the other hand, one advantage of, of SMS is that you can do the surveys at your leisure, right? Um, IVR and live phone interviews, you have to be present when you're called typically, um, but SMS you can do at your leisure. The response rate. So, so mobile phone response rates, you know, um, because of the issues I mentioned on the previous slide, are all lower than face-to-face -face surveys, right? Um, the response rates vary quite a bit by mode, sample type, and country. Here, I'm just I just listed a few kind of ranges of response rates. There's a lot of variation in this, um, so please take these as kind of more of a general guide rather than hard and hard and fast. I'm sure. 
sometimes they'll be better and sometimes they'll be worse um, than, than these ranges. I did want to um, you know, introduce a caution about focusing on, on response rates, however. So response rates are, um, we talk about them a lot because they're easy to measure, right? Um, but lo and lower response rates can increase the chance of bias um, of not representing the population correctly. But response rates are you know, not a direct measure of survey quality. Like they don't really tell you anything about representativeness itself. So if you care about you know, representing the population correctly, you know, a 20% response rate in itself is not any better than a 5% response rate. Um, increasing, if you do a study, increasing from an 8% response rate to a 16% response rate, um, maybe is a worthy goal to try to pursue, but unless you're ch changing the mix of people that come into your survey, um, you don't really have evidence that your survey is any better. Um, so, and there's a large literature and survey methodology that kind of like walks, um, um, demonstrates this point. So, um, so while response, like we will al always use response rates, they'll always be there. Um, our stakeholders will always ask for them, but it's important to be educated. I would caution about the impact of low response rates. So from a representativeness perspective, you know, how well do survey respondents match the you know, socio-demographic characteristics of the larger population. Um, we typically measure this by, you know, comparing a mobile phone survey sample to, you know, census or a mixed survey, um, a gold standard face-to-face -face survey. Um, there are a few methodological studies out there. So we did one in Nigeria. I'll show you some results in the next slide. Um, um, that showed that even though Caddy or like the live interviewers um, method had a higher response rate than IVR and SMS. The difference in representativeness was actually quite mixed. Um, so we concluded there was no real clear winner. Um, there was another study in Burkina Faso that um, recontacted people that did a previous face-to-face -face survey, and Caddy is really the you know preferred over over IVR. Um, and again, I'll show you some results in the next few slides, but I would say that there's, you know, the, the research is not there yet in terms of um, uh, determining which mode produces the most representative data. Um, uh, I would say, please don't be blinded by response rates, but when you're doing your own studies, really look at rep concepts of, of representativeness by comparing your survey against uh, um, gold standard data. Um, and as we'll see, weighting can help, but you know, isn't um, won't solve all your problems. Um, so I would say, from a representativeness perspective, there is we don't really know enough to you know tell which mode is is um, is the uh, preferred. Um, most people, I would say, in COVID research, are choosing CADI simply because it can contain a larger volume of of questions. That's a key advantage of CADI over IVR and SMS. So here are some, just some uh, really simple plots. Um, the paper is down below um, if you're interested in the details that kind of can um, show comparisons between the face-to-face -face survey, this is a demographic and health survey, and um, mobile survey modes. This was from a paper we published last year. Oops. And um, here we're comparing mobile phone survey um, composition to the gold standard face-to-face. So here you see that all mobile phone surveys are overrepresenting younger people. Um, the live interviews with Caddy are closest to face-to-face. -face. Um, IVR and SMS um, are worse at overrepresenting younger people. From a percent female, um, mobile phone surveys um, generally underrepresent um, uh, um, women. Um, although this varies by country, there is. Um, uh, Steve Glazerman from Innovations from Poverty Action gave a really interesting presentation recently showing that um, sometimes women are overrepresented um, in some countries. So again, this varies um, by country. This is a study from Nigeria. SMS actually did the best in terms of uh, reaching women. Um, we don't really know why this is happening. It's possible that you know women are less likely to pick up a call from an unknown you know um, number. For CADI and IVR, whereas SMS, they can um, 
um, they can read and, and understand who it's from. The biggest limitation with mobile phone surveys is this graph down here, right? Showing that, you know, um, um, all mobile phone surveys are going to underrepresent people and with lo the lowest levels of education. So uh, if you're using RDD, random digit dialing, this is the method where you randomly generate phone numbers um, to, to measure um, the population and you, the lowest education groups are really important, um, you're gonna have some, some problems. And again, waiting can, can fix some of these things, but doesn't completely resolve it. Um, these are just some other examples, kind of skip these in the interest of time. Um, so waiting, so there are different ways of waiting mobile phone um, data. Um, the, um, this is an example from the paper in Nigeria where we looked at voting with SMS and IVR self-reports, compared it to the, um, the um, accurate, the true estimate. Um, of course, this isn't just about representation, like people can, you know, um, um, there might be social desirability and measurement issues. But I think the take home point here is that waiting helped us um, get SMS and IVR more um, closer to the true value. So the unweighted, um, um, the unweighted estimates were actually a lot higher than this. So waiting brought it in more in line with the true estimate, but it's still off. Um, all right, so if you're going to do these surveys, what, um, what can you do? Um, so one is um, offering incentives, but don't blow your budget. So um, typically, if there's a lot of experiments showing that if you, um, if you increase the incentive or if you double it, it um, has a very small impact on response rates and representativeness. Um, stick to relatively short surveys. Um, sending you can sending reminders is important. Typically, we we recommend um, between four to six. Um, people who participate on the fifth invitation, for example, are typically a lot different than the people who respond to the first one, and they're more likely to be low education and people that are harder to harder to capture. Um, Using really short introductions is really key. This is something that we've seen a lot. We've done some experiments in, in Zambia, for example, where just removing like one, one sh very short sentence from the introduction can have a substantial impact on, on response rates. Um, so um, test your introductions really carefully, keep them super short. Um, it's important to ask about multiple and shared phones. Um, we can talk about this later if you're interested, if there are any statisticians in the, in the, on the webinar who want to talk about probabilities of selection. This is um, one area that's important to do. For IVR, using female and vo you know, voices and inbound calling is useful. Um, and then on the next slides, I'll show some, um, some other examples with some data. So one, movement in mobile phone survey methods over the past you know, few years is really to mix modes. So um, typically surveys are conducted in a single mode, but um, one way to improve the quality of these surveys is to combine these modes into, into, um, in a single survey. So there are a lot of pretty interesting ways to, to do this. So you know, if you're gonna do um, a, a live uh, voice survey, a caddy survey, you can send an SMS in advance saying, hey, you're gonna get um, a call in 24 hours uh, from the Ministry of Health, you know, please, we would, we would appreciate your participation. So giving people kind of a heads up. There are, another method is sequential mixed mode. So that's when you start with, you invite everyone in the sample with one mode. So maybe you start with SMS. And then you follow up the non-respondents with IVR or a different mode. Um, so that's a way you're offering both um, modes to people. Some people will respond via SMS and other people will, will respond via IVR. So this is what, like in the survey world, we call a non-response follow-up. Um, another design is a concurrent mixed mode. So you give people the choice. So you can say, hey, you can you know, um, uh, participate via SMS or IVR here's how to do SMS, here's how to do IVR, it's up to you. You know, if you're doing a, um, a caddy survey or an IVR survey, you could send reminders via SMS um, in a different mode. You can also do a mode switch within a questionnaire. So maybe you have 
a live um, interview with Caddy, uh, but then you have some sensitive questions, then you want to switch to IVR um, for those sensitive questions. This is something that um, the PMA 2020 group um, does with some of their surveys. Um, and then if you're doing a longitudinal survey over time, you know, you can use different modes. Um, maybe you start with uh, a caddy study and then you say at the end of the interview, um, hey, we're going to, you know, we'd like to follow up with you with SMS or IVR, you know, to do weekly surveys. Would you be interested in that? Um, when you do mixed mode surveys, it's, it's best to use a um, survey tool that's really built for mixed mode surveys. Um, this is an, there are a few out there. This is one that we built um, as part of the, the NCD project. Um, it's called Surveyda. It's an open source um, SMS IVR web mixed mode tool um, orient, oriented for ministries of health to use. Um, and we've used it in eight countries with, um, for uh, disease surveillance. Um, here's an example from South Africa. So a lot of what I kind of talked about here when I went through the representativeness slides. This is all about RDD, right? Random digit dial. Another really important use of mobile phone surveys though is beneficiary tracking. And I suspect that a lot of UNICEF use cases for mobile phone surveys might be in beneficiary tracking um, or monitoring and evaluation. So this is an example, um, the link is below where we tracked um, people who participated in youth employment training programs. And what we did is we randomized them into two groups. So one group here and one group over here. In the first group, we started by sending them SMS invitations. We got a 19% response rate. And then we used a sequential mixed mode design to invite the non-respondents via web and the response rate bumped up a little bit. In the other group, we started with web, 8% um, response rate, and then we followed up with, with SMS and the response rate went up to 14%. So there, um, the paper has a lot of detail if you're interested in it, but I think this is an example of where beneficiary tracking, um, you know, it, it shows higher response rates and more representative data um, than with an RDD approach. Um, I'll skip this here just in the interest of time, but these are some data on SMS um, pre-notification. Another important thing for uh, beneficiary tracking is, um, you, is uh, being able to clean the data and from, this, uh, from the sample. So a lot of times when you're, uh, if you get um, a list of beneficiaries from a partner, um, sometimes it's old, um, out of date. So before you're going to contact people by SMS, IVR, or even CADI, it's really good to do a, a short round of um, cleaning up, contacting people to clean up their phone numbers, confirm that you have the right people. Um, this, this is an example from Kenya where we um, got some data from vocational uh, you know, um, um, schools and then we were gonna call them. We found that, we, you know, so we reached about half the sample and for a good portion of those, we needed to update phone numbers. That's something key for beneficiary tracking. Okay, so um, so now on to measurement. So, and I'm mindful of the time, so I'll go through this relatively um, swiftly. So um, in terms of designing questionnaires, so it's important to recognize the constraints. So with, you know, all mobile phone modes, but especially with IVR and SMS, um, you know, you don't have an interviewer. Um, you need to assume that respondents have never done a survey like this before. Then you just have constraints on how many questions, the space for questions as well. Uh, with IVR, there may be recency effects, right? So like the last things you hear in an audio recording are things you're more likely to remember. And then SMS, you're going to have, um, you know, you have about 160 characters for both the question and the response options. So um, here are some tips on um, one, the, most important thing I would say is you really need to adopt a different mentality when you're writing questions for mobile phone surveys. I've seen sometimes what people do is they take the face-to-face -face survey question and then they you know, paste it in their, their survey specs and then they just start editing. Um, and this is like an approach I would not recommend. I think when you, um, you really need to start fresh when writing questions for mobile phone surveys, um, 
to make sure that they make sense to respondents. You're not going to be able to include everything in the face-to-face -face survey in the, in the mobile survey. Uh, for SMS, it's best to minimize multiple messages. You might be tempted to kind of send multiple messages um, uh, because of the, of the constraint, but that can lead to some difficulties. Um, we can't use the select all that apply. Um, people don't know how to answer a select all that apply in mobile phone surveys, so you need to kind of answer one by one. Um, it's best to randomize the risk order, the order of response options, um, some instruction stuff, and, um, and of course, test, test, test. So I'll skip these. This is an example here of just showing where um, challenges with multiple messages, sometimes they arrive out of order or not at all. So there are challenges there. And then, you know, just to, it's important to conduct some usability testing, you know, remembering that what, what it looks like, question looks like on your screen is not how your response are seen. So important to, um, important to do usability testing to see how the questionnaire renders on people's phones. So I'll skip these questions, these things. Okay, so say you want to get started. Um, here are five questions that you might consider. So one is what mode of, um, of data collection to, to conduct? Um, and there are a few you know, factors that affect this, right? So thinking about the population, is this a low literacy country, a high literacy country? Are you tracking you know, um, beneficiaries um, from a food security program or uh, from a vocational you know, training program, for example? Um, so these things affect your, your choice of mode. Your team's capacity, of course, and then you know the, making those trade-offs with cost, speed, and and quality, um, as well. If you do want to use SMS or IVR, um, another key decision is: do you do this in-house or do you work with a vendor? Um, probably the biggest decision, you know, the biggest factor here is about your team's capacity. Do you have the technical capacity um, to do these things in-house, or do you need to work with a vendor? Um, in-house can be um, a bigger investment up front, but then pays off um, later if you do multiple surveys. Um, this is the, the channel comes up here. So again, remember the channel is the way that your survey tool, like survey to that survey tool I sent you earlier where you program questions, do you have a way to send it through the telecommunications network? Um, typically in-house you know, is better for repeated surveys and the vendor is better for kind of one-off surveys. Um, and of course, you know, doing in-house, we always prefer to do that for purposes of capacity building and strengthening health information systems. Um, other questions to ask that, you know, these three, three through five may not be on the forefront of your mind, but I would encourage you to think about them, right? So one is, you know, framing appropriate expectations with stakeholders. You know, on one hand, we want to be honest and upfront, of course, um, with stakeholders about what these modes can and cannot do. Um, and um, selling, you know, like selling the method in a way that reflects where it is in its development. Um, the fourth is, you know, what pilots and experiments will, will, we, will we run? I would recommend that every single project using any mobile phone survey mode, pilot um, modes, question wording, introductions, do a lot of pilot testing. And the fifth is thinking about issues of IRB and research ethics. Um, if IRBs are applicable, um, talking to the IRB earlier is is a good it's a good thing because these new modes of data collection are um, uh, le are are kind of unknown to a lot of IRBs. So I will wrap up with um, three brief conclusions. Um, one is kind of a basic point, but it's worth considering. You know, when we get in the weeds of thinking about issues of measurement and representation. You know, these are really new modes. Um, the technology is recent. The application <clears throat> of the technology to survey research is, is quite new. And we're really only beginning to understand, like, for what research questions do, do these modes make sense? Uh, for what populations do these modes make sense and not make sense? Um, and what I've done here is I've pasted this uh, screenshot from an article from the year 2000, just as a way to kind of anchor these new modes in your mind. Um, this was a paper um, where um, the internet was you know, booming and people were starting to think about you know, web surveys as a mode of data collection. 
kind of find it entertaining that it says that they had to define World Wide Web and then they have www in parentheses um, and they distinguish the internet from the web. Um, but I think this is a illustration where, you know, with when we think about IVR and SMS, where they're like in 2020, IVR and SMS are the same place that web surveys were in in the year 2000, right? So now we take web surveys in, in a lot of countries for, for granted, they're a standard part of the way we operate. And um, so, um, but back in 2000, there were a lot of questions about them, right? So we're sort of in the same place where we're all grappling to figure out how do we harness the power of these new modes and use them appropriately. Um, so that's just something to think about in terms of the evolution of survey modes over time. Second is really around experimentation. So, you know, the literature and best practices is still emerging. It takes time to do experiments, publish them, share results, disseminate as a research community. And um, so because we don't have this and because that there's just a lot of variation across countries, as I've mentioned, um, you know, pilot studies are really critical. Right. So every study should, like, in my view, have experiments on all these things and then not just to do experiments, but to share them and um, with with your colleagues within UNICEF and with the broader research community. And the third takeaway is um, it's not like is to avoid the trap of the zero sum game. Right. So whenever a new mode of data collection comes on and it is being used, um, the you know, people always, the natural impulse is to sort of do head-to-head -head comparisons, like which mode is better? So in the 80s, there were a lot of interesting articles saying, you know, worried that telephone surveys in high-income countries were going to kind of completely destroy face-to-face -face surveys and mail surveys and everything. So there's a lot of kind of consternation in the research community. But instead of kind of asking like, which mode is better, you know, overall, ask yourself some different questions, right? Ask yourself, in what context would it be appropriate for me, me to use these, these modes? Um, or what populations and research questions? Um, what things do we not measure now that we could because of these new face-to-face, -face, because of these new modes? Sort of like what possibilities do these new modes offer? And then also how can we combine modes? How can we view, you know, IVR, SMS, Caddy as a complement to existing face-to-face -face data collection um, um, approaches. How can we combine modes to reduce cost, um, improve quality of surveys? So I'm happy to turn to the Q&A now. Um, thanks for um, your attention and I look forward to hearing about um, your questions. I will stop sharing my screen so we can see. Everyone. Thank you very much, Charles. That was that was fascinating. V very useful information. Um, I've I've been trying to track the the comments and the questions in the chat box, but please do so yourself too. But just to make your life easier, I know it's difficult to uh, to to go through all the chat box questions while you're presenting. Uh, let me. Uh, I've tried to group some of the uh, comments and questions as much as possible, and I will I will I will mention them. Uh, th there has been several comments about the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the bias uh, introduced, especially in S SMS, due to literacy levels. Uh, that's more of a comment. Uh, but there has been several uh, questions about weights and bias, uh, two related issues. Um, mm -hmm. One of them uh, was about the weighting approach in RDDs. Uh, how do we exactly do it? How what does it exactly mean? Uh, especially if we don't know the total number of possible calls, are we referring to response rates when it comes to RDDs in terms of the number of households that picked up the phone and, and answered? How does, mm -hmm. how does uh, response rate calculation work there? Um, but there? There was some other uh, similar questions on weighting approaches in RDD as well. Uh, another question related was, um, is there any guidance in uh, standard guidance on, on using weights in, uh, in less developed countries when phone coverage is low. Um, what else? I think those, those can be grouped all as, as bias and, um, and, uh, and weighting. Uh, there was a comment or question on how can we minimize the possible effect of, of providing incentives on the respondents? Uh, 
when it provides incentives, does it lead to any kind of bias in terms of the responses? And uh, a couple of questions on which mode would be better to use to collect data from on vulnerable populations, specifically on children, on, on families of vulnerable students, for instance, was an example that was given. And uh, would you like to, to, to respond to these and, and then we can go on to a second group of questions? Sure. Thank you, Attila. Um, so on the, res um, on the first question, I'll divide this into kind of two. One is about response rates and another is about weighting. Um, so response rate calculations for these surveys um, follow established you know, um, best practices in, in all surveys um, there um, for calculating the response rates. Um, we, you divide it into, you know, completes, partials, um, attempted refusals, et cetera. Uh, we use the American Association for Public Opinion Research as our benchmark for response rate calculations. From a weighting perspective, um, the, I think the, the commenter is correct to point out that with RDD, we don't have information on the sampling frame to be able to, um, do extensive weighting adjustments, right? So if you're recontacting people from a previous face-to-face -face survey, you're able to, to draw from that existing auxiliary, in, auxiliary information. If you don't have that though, there's still things you can do, right? So um, there are non-response adjustments you could do. So in the survey we just finished in Bolivia, we um, knew the phone number, the uh, mobile network operator and the geography that associated with each phone number we tried to contact. And for underrepresented geographies or mobile network operators, we adjusted them through weights. And then what you can also do is calibration to known population total. So if um, what we did in Bolivia and what we do in other countries is to take a gold standard data source, census, mixed DHS, et cetera, and um, align, use calibration to align the mobile phone sample to the known population totals. So typically we do this with, you know, four or five variables, age, gender, education, urban, urban, rural, um, to be able to calibrate those. So the advantage here is that with the mobile phone sample can align to the population control totals. Um, the disadvantage though is it introduces unequal weighting effects and that affects your variability in the analysis um, as well. In addition to the cali to calibration, there's some interesting approaches now where, um, that use um, Bayesian methods um, to, um, to um, calibrate um, and adjust for, for bias as well. So on the in question on incentives, um, there, um, the general thinking is that incentives are important to, to provide in the sense that, you know, even if it's not, doesn't cost the participant um, amount to use their phones, um, it is a way to encourage participation. And also, you know, people, especially more vulnerable populations, um, you know, doing a survey on their phone may cost them money, right? If they have to um, pay for power, uh, to power up their phone later. Um, most of the studies show on incentives show that it doesn't produce it, um, large effects either on the response rate or the representativeness either way. Um, so there's, I would say that there's not, a, there's not evidence that it leads to, to bias. For modes for vulnerable populations, um, so the, um, one of the maybe, um, maybe promising approaches here is to do a follow-up study with from a prior face-to-face -face survey, right? So if you're, if you have face-to-face uh, -face survey participants, uh, then you're, if you have their phone numbers, you're able to, to call them up. I think during, you know, COVID, it's particularly tricky, but you might think about, um, you might think about this in the future. Um, if you're able to link people when you're actually doing the face-to-face -face survey, get their phone numbers and then contact them afterwards. For the vulnerable populations, you probably want to use, um, IVR or live calling. Um, there are probably some ethical issues with SMS as well because the responses kind of live on people's phones too. Um, so it raises some issues if you're doing any studies on sensitive topics. And I saw a, a comment in the, in the chat about um, uh -huh. um, uh, references for the Bayesian approach. And if um, 
if you can if you email me i'm happy to provide some more information on that thank you very much charles uh, a second group of questions quickly if we may um there's there was a, a, a few comments on piloting and, and testing uh, which you referred to as well and you actually said test 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 uh which is great uh, and you I, i'm very glad that you pointed out that uh, just lifting off questions from a face-to-face -face survey and, and inserting them into a, a CATI survey or an RDD. That doesn't really work that way. Shouldn't really work that way. But maybe to expand that question a little bit or the comment a little bit, um, exactly how, how would piloting work? In, in the case of face-to-face uh, -face surveys, for instance, some uh, survey organizations do a lot of cognitive testing in terms of making sure that the questions are properly understood, etc. Uh, are there applications of such cognitive testing uh, when it comes to uh, phone surveys, especially with regard to the fact that the question you have to be more much more economical with questions, question length and less probing is possible during phone surveys and therefore uh, cognitive test, uh, cogn you know, misunderstanding of questions and all those uh, typical problems that we know of are at higher risk. Um, mm -hmm. There was a practical question on how do we validate the, the quality of data, especially when a third party, a, a company for us, a private vendor, for instance, is doing, let's, let, let me make it even more concrete, the, uh, the possible example that our colleague had in mind. When the third party is, is doing, has, has done an IVR survey that we have commissioned and uh, they refuse to share the individual data. So we, we had no alternative ways of, of, uh, of understanding what kind of uh, data quality we are looking at and what kind of debiasing uh, even that may have been used. And finally, um, how flexible is IVR for partial interviews or breaks during responses and returning to continue to, to the response later? Mm -hmm. um, maybe those are some, some of the good questions that, that came. All, all questions were really good, really uh, great comment. And uh, before I hand it over to you, I must say that there's several several uh, comments of, of colleagues who are very impressed with the presentation okay fantastic it, this has been really fun um to do so thanks for the great questions and i wish we had more time we could talk about this all day and, and happy to to find some other time to do that so um um so th thanks for that from a piloting perspective um it's a great comment that piloting is different from mobile um one thing um, one tool that I always recommend that um, is done probably 10% of the time, but ha is really effective, is to read your questions aloud. I will, um, I'm always surprised by how many surveys um, go into the field that the researchers themselves doing a mock interview uh, with other researchers, just go in the other room. I would say that, you know, 50 or 60% of, when I review questionnaires, 50 or 60% of the, the, my comments could be avoided if the research team actually just did some mock interviews and, they, and they, they would probably see for themselves some of the issues that happen. So that's not a sophisticated answer, but it's, it's not a sophisticated tool, but it's a really important and very low effort thing to do. So just, it's like in the category of things that are kind of obvious to do, but sometimes get lost in the shuffle. From a mobile perspective, you know, you can also get a lot through in, in office testing. So face-to-face -face surveys invest a lot with, you know, going out and testing with real survey respondents. Um, that's more difficult, especially during COVID, but you can get a lot of, um, um, of you can make a lot of headway just by working with um, folks in the office um, and doing some um, testing. There are also some really interesting methods. We're working on this for cognitive testing. So that's where you, um, administer the survey, then ask people to talk about their thought process with comprehension and retrieval in answering the questions. Doing that in a face-to-face -face setting is a lot easier and it's a little more challenging and with an audio um, situation. Um, so, but we're working on how to adapt that. Um, you, it requires um, a different approach typically with more um, um, uh, concurrent probing rather than waiting at the end doing it earlier on, but this is a really important area. In terms of validating the quality of the data, I, I don't know if I heard the question right, but if a vendor does not share individual level data with, with you, I would recommend that you not work with that vendor. Um, all vendors should, 
be providing individual level micro data to sponsors of surveys. All vendors should um, also be provide, providing complete case dispositions. So case dispositions are like outcomes of the survey, like completes, partials, break off refusals. The, the, this is standard stuff. So I like to me, if I heard that question correctly, that raises a, a red flag. Um, there are some you know, QC indicators that you, you can ask for and you should have access to as well. Um, surrounding, you know, length of interviews, um, timing of interviews, etc. So that's one way of validating um, the quality of data. The last question was around the, the flexibility of IVR for, for, quest, for um, break offs. It's an interesting question. It depends on the system. Um, so some of the more sophisticated IVR systems allow people to call back in. So if there is, if you're doing a, a survey and there, you know, um, you get to question 10 and then the, the call drops, the uh, respondent will be able to call back into the survey and start where they left off because the IVR system can recognize their, their number um, as well. So that's one tool for more advanced IVR systems. Thank you very much for those uh, responses, uh, Charles. Uh, one, one question, I just remembered that it came before the, uh, the, the webinar started even, that uh, there's a general feeling or impression that the RD, uh, RDD surveys are more representative than uh, th than those which are which are based on list of samples that are that are you know retrieved from phone companies etc. How would you comment on that one? I was I was wondering. Mm. Uh, so comment, I think. Um, why don't you go ahead and I will read that comment myself uh, while you answer the question. Sure. Um, so this is an, an area that like comparing RDD versus a list sample from a prior survey versus a list sample from a telecom company, this is all going to be highly country specific and specific to this to the survey you're using. So this is an example where I would um, I would do some testing if, if you have the, the budget and resources. If you don't have an ability to compare um, the, um, the different modes, I would say that, you know, being able to contact and via mobile people that you are, that are known people. So those that like participated in a face-to-face -face survey before, um, you kind of can't beat that. Um, these are people that have already invested in a survey project and are more likely to respond and also probably give you better responses if they do respond. Um, so I would say that, you know, if you're able to recontacting people from a prior face-to-face -face survey is, you know, pro probably a, a good approach. Again, you're limited in the, the size you have from there and um, a lot of numbers may not be working as well. Um, RDD, of, of course, you don't have the richness of the information on the sampling frame and you also lose um, the response rates will be lower, um, but it's also quick to do. One note just on prior surveys, make sure that if you're trying to contact people from prior surveys, you have their consent to do so. Um, the best practice is to only recontact people from whom you have agreement to, to call back as well. So that may just be a good practice too, to put in your face-to-face -face surveys going forward. At UNICEF, always have a standard, can we contact you again by phone? Um, even if you don't have plans to, um, just so you have that in your back pocket um, to use for, for future surveys, depending on your need. Thanks, thanks Charles. Uh, just a final one. Uh, what data collection method is recommended for measuring reach of distance learning using radio and TV channels, which is the reality in many countries right now, uh, despite the inherent wealth bias? Right. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so um, I think it probably depends on the, the country, um, but something like a, com a computer assisted uh, telephone interview, live interviews is probably a good place to start. One reference that may help you is um, Innovations for Poverty Action is doing some interesting work with distance with um, educational assessments and distance learning. So if you, if you haven't looked at their stuff, um, I would recommend it. They have a nice, um, COVID-19 like research hub as well. So that might be able to give you some more clues kind of specific to, to distance learning. Thank you so much, Charles. This has been really great. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to be part of this new adventure that we have started on, on, uh, on this webinar series on data collection.
uh, I would like to thank you and, and all the participants for their great questions and comments. Just to whet everybody's appetites, uh, we have uh, the other webinars lined up um, on a number of different methods. We're going to be talking further about phone surveys, CATI surveys. Uh, in in one, one webinar, we are going to be focusing more on uh, the sampling issues and, and debiasing and weighting issues more technically. Um, and uh, we are going to be talking about CATI surveys based on uh, frames from House of Surveys. We will be talking about uh, satellite imagery and, and drone data. So there's a lot that will be coming up uh, in the next few weeks until the end of, uh, end of October. So thank you so much. And uh, knowing that we all have calls and, and other business to go to these days, especially calls are very, very many. I thank you once again and uh, have a great day, everyone. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.